Associate Professor of Anthropology and South Asian Studies at the Australia National University. He is co-author with Robin Jeffrey of Waste of a Nation, Garbage and Growth in India. Sanchaita Gajapati is the founder of SANA, a non-profit that uses technology to provide safe drinking water and sanitation to underserved communities. Sana is winner of the Google Impact Challenge, and Gajapati recently joined politics as a member of the BJP. Robin Jeffrey, the moderator for the session, is a visiting research professor at the Institute of South, South Asia Studies in Singapore. He is the co-author of Waste of a Nation, the subject for the session this afternoon. Proudly brought to you by the Aga Khan Foundation, please join me in welcoming to the stage Asa Dohan, Sanchaita Gajapati, and Robin Jeffrey. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to a topic that may seem distasteful at first glance, but I think uh, if you're here, it probably means you find the question of waste, Swatch Bharat, and so on, as fascinating as we do. Uh, may I ask how many people were at the previous session this morning that Sanchaita uh, chaired? That's good. We consider you our friends, and we'll be looking for support from you through the rest of the uh, 55 minutes. Uh, the, what uh, I should also say is, you'll see that we're only three players today, and I was nominated as the umpire. I feel a little bit uncomfortable doing that, because I'm also a, a perpetrator of the book, Waste of a Nation, that the session is uh, named for. So we, we, among the three of us, we've decided that there will be three umpires and three bats, bats persons, I should say. Sorry, sorry, bats persons. And we'll be asking each other questions. We'll uh, try to create a conversation. But, and uh, in, that, uh, in that spirit, uh, I th thought I would give the first question to uh, umpire number two over here, if I'm number, umpire number one. Sanchaita, over to you. What, what can we ask you to ask? <laughs> well, you know, when we talk about the waste of a nation, the one thing I'll assure all of you who are here, is this is not going to be a waste of a session. So thank you for being here after a lovely lunch. Um, you know, this is something that affects all of us. Post-liberalization, I think we've become a very different country. There are many young people here in the audience born after the economy has opened up, half after you're having you know, access to a lot of consumerism, uh, the whole nature of how we live and how we work and how we uh, you know, live our day-to-day -day lives has hugely changed. And waste is something that affects our everyday life. Now, I work in, in a rural part of India, in the district of Vishakhapatnam and in Delhi, which is also, of course, our capital. And I work largely in water and sanitation. And when we talk about waste, I think all these are intrinsically linked. So uh, let me tell you what we do so that you know, it will make a little sense to people. Uh, we work with the people who are absolutely left out of the conversation, people who are at the bottom of the pyramid, as aspirational as anybody else, and we provide them with access to safe drinking water and sanitation using technology. Because I believe that technology can transform lives. And uh, we have worked in villages and in schools where we set up solar-powered water stations. We give people access to safe water, we use the wastewater in bio-toilets, which don't need any human intervention. It's a very safe sanitation solution that works on the ground and try to create a self-sustaining ecosystem. Now, when we talk about waste, you cannot separate that from water. We have some 6,000 children who die from diarrheal-related diseases, and the main contaminant you find in groundwater is E. coli, which comes from untreated human waste. 
So when we work in water and sanitation, I've realized that you have to have localized solutions and you have to train people and make them part of the solution. They're not part of the problem. So we train people from within the community to operate and maintain the entire system. We train plumbers, we train electricians, but we create a revenue stream for them so that if something goes wrong, there is money available for them to deal with any crisis. But most importantly, in the previous session, we talked about behavioral change. You know, how do we change our attitude towards waste, towards sanitation? Our waste is our responsibility. How do you get that mindset to change? That isn't something that happens overnight. We work with people, with local healthcare workers, talk to them about the importance of using toilets, the benefits associated with uh, you know, accessing safe sanitation. And these are things that happen very gradually. So on policy and on paper, we have some of the best ideas and the best policies. But at the end of the day, if it isn't a grassroots movement, a Jan Andolan, like the Prime Minister says, these things really don't work. Uh, I was giving you the opportunity to ask a question too. <laughs> but uh, if you don't want to be an interlocutor, <laughs> then I guess it's back to me. The, uh, with the, the kind of uh, work that we've done, that is, Asi and I, uh, it, there's a, a sense of presumption in two foreigners writing about waste in India, and I think it's a fair question to try to justify, uh, if not justify, at least explain our curiosity about a subject. I can assure you there's plenty of waste in Australia that needs to be studied, and we might well be told that we should be spending our time on our home turf. Um, but Asi, explain how we got the uh, garbage waste bug. It's your fault. Uh, Absolutely. And I think it's important also to remember that waste is everywhere. It's not limited to India, and waste is also dumped everywhere. From my perspective, when we did our previous book, Robin and myself, we wrote about India's mobile phone revolution. It's called a Cell Phone Nation here in India. And one of the chapters dealt with the fact that there are many people in India that have a very limited purchasing power. And they need to prolong the life of their mobile phones. So I spent some time doing field work in Gafar market and looking at the places where these mobiles are repaired. And I, what was revealed to me is all these dead mobiles. A billion dead mobiles. Where, where do they go? Where does all this e-waste go? And I started tracking the people who bring all these dead mobiles to different places in India, one of which is in Delhi and Shilampur, which I visited. And once I visited that area and saw people cooking the mobile phone and, and extracting the valuable materials from it and being exposed to a whole slew of, of risks. I mean, something to, to remember about waste, there's a waste chain, but at the bottom of that waste chain, are those people who are locked into dealing with it, and they're exposed to an inventory of risks, both physical risks, whether they're injured from glass or electronic waste, and contamination, but also social stigma. And these people might be the ones who are Dalits or landless laborers or poor Muslims who come to these slums and deal with our waste. And seeing the bargaining electronic waste, both in Shilampur and Moradabad and UP, this, this kind of gave, gave us the idea that, look, there's a problem here. We need to, to look at this more carefully. And as we began investigating, this is, was 2012, before uh, Modi's Swachh Bharat, we decided that there's a bigger story here about waste in India. After all, as, as, as you just said, India, since economic reforms in the 1990s, has become, it's become an urbanizing uh, country. 40% of the population live in urban spaces. Its uh, population density is unlike anywhere else in the, war, in the world. And people are enthusiastically embracing this kind of consumer capitalism, consuming constantly new goods, whether it's white goods, electronic goods, clothing. And then on top of that, you have the urbanization and the construction debris, mm. and you have the factory effluence and the industrial effluence. So it's almost a perfect storm of waste which we tried in the book to kind of piece together. Yes, if uh, one talks to people who deal with waste at many levels, 
the, uh, the scientific and the engineering people will really categorize waste into different sorts, which have different kinds of quantities and different sorts of capacity for being reused. One of the biggest occupiers of landfill is not always our domestic waste, the waste that we all experience every day, but it's construction and demolition waste, which has to be dumped somewhere and often takes up a great deal of space. It can have value if it's processed properly, and ca it can carry great value, but again, too often it's dumped. Uh, hazardous and toxic waste, as Assi says, the sorts of effluent that come out of uh, the great factories of this country as it industrializes. Uh, this morning in the session Sanchaita was involved with, we, we were talking mostly about toilets and uh, domestic waste, but of course an awful lot of liquid waste is not domestic, it is uh, industrial, both pharmaceutical and uh, it, it, the kind of uh, chemicals that go with great factories, the poisonous chemicals that are necessary for manufacture. Assi is particularly interested these days in pharmaceutical waste, that is the waste that comes out of the great pharmaceutical factories of Hyderabad and Bangalore. And he, part of the book, as we, we travel throughout India, what you see, and that's related also to e-waste, a lot of what, for waste to accrue kind of value, it needs to be stored somewhere, it needs to be on the move, and there's a lot of, of issues going on now with China blocking its, its uh, uh, waste, uh, imports of waste, so a lot of e-waste is being dumped into other uh, places like India. But another really revealing aspect of this is the pharmaceutical. India has become the pharmaceutical capital of the world. A lot of pharmaceuticals, especially antibiotics, is no longer viable to produce in the so-called Western world. So, in the best tradition of Ding, what, what do they do? They offshore these factories to India's uh, Hyderabad and other places. Those factories occupy special economic zones and they produce those antibiotics. But when I went to visit these fortified multinational companies, what you see outside them is effluents and liquid waste spewing out into the fields which are decimated, into water bodies where, where fish are dead, where the locals who live besides these pharmaceutical companies develop skin infections and other diseases that they can't explain. Now it creates what you call bacteria resistance, or it's known popularly as superbugs. Now these superbugs, they, they're not confined to caste or class or gender, they travel. So unless, and today there was in, in the paper, there was a, a piece in the paper about the kind of antibiotic resistance that's plaguing India. They were talking about over-the-counter issues that antibiotics is given, but there's also the question of waste, which compounds the problem of, of, of sanitation. That, I think, takes us, too, to the question of technology. Um, Sanjayta is a believer in the liberating capacity of technology. When we did the book, we really tried to put together what are the, an overview of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are waste management. And we have a chapter in the book on technology, on the various sorts of technologies, particularly the search for the perfect toilet. Now, Sanjaita's uh, NGO may in fact have found the solution to the perfect toilet or one that's quite close. Tell us something about that and also tell us something about the mini sewage treatment plants, the technical advance that may allow the treatment of sewage in India's cities much more effectively. You know, the one thing I think that when you work in the grassroots is you have to take in the reality in which we work. So whether we like it or not, in India, the caste system, even though it's officially banned, it is a reality that comes in in sanitation. And that's why when you look at, say, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh and you compare them with India and how we've done in sanitation, this has really been a major challenge for us. And so we said, why not use technology to leverage that and overcome that challenge? Because nobody likes to go in and clean the septic tanks. And we do not have uh, sewage pipelines in all our villages. Forget villages, even in our big cities, even in Delhi. We do not have more than, I think, 15% of our homes connected to the sewage pipelines. So that's why we said, why don't we look for a solution where there's no human intervention that's required? And that's when we zeroed in on bio-toilets. Now, as a nonprofit, we are technology agnostic. It's not my invention. In fact, it's the DRDO's invention, which is part of the Ministry of Defense. It's only in the last five, seven years that it's available for civilian use. And quite simply, all that happens is there is a tank 
which is put underground. There's an inoculum of bacteria that's put inside, and it eats up all the human waste. Where does the... It's, to me, this is a kind of magic, which Indian, Railway is, is Indian Railways is also yes. introducing. But the question, where does the inoculum come from? This thing, the inoculum, it takes about 120 liters, I think, to get a, a process going. But who makes it? Do you buy it in packages in the supermarket? And I'd like <laughs> a bag of inoculum, please. I wish it was available off the shelf, but unfortunately, yes. you need a license to sell that, and that license you have to get from the Ministry of DRDO. You have a number of licensed vendors who can sell that. And there are some who don't have a license. I would advise you not to go to them. Yes. But of course, if you go to the people who have the technical expertise, then this is a solution that actually works on the ground. We've been working for the last seven years. Mm -hmm. And I, w there is a cost to technology, but I really believe, I mean, for every dollar you invest in water and sanitation, you get an eight or nine dollar return in terms of increased productivity and reduced healthcare costs. So, I mean, when we look at sanitation, and I just, uh, in our previous session, we were talking about it, I said, we can't look at the L1 method. We can't cater to the lowest common denominator. We can use technology as an enabler and a bio toilet, and you have to ensure that you also have running water. And I am a firm believer that you need water. We're a country that, you know, washes our bums. We don't use tissue paper. So you need to take in these cultural realities when you're designing any kind of solution, and that's what we try to do. But when you talk about waste management, I live in Delhi. Now, Delhi, you can't start digging up the whole city right now. You need to find ways to treat waste at source, localized yeah. Uh, mini solutions. Sanjaya, can I ask you, and perhaps people in the audience will be able to comment when we have our question and comment time later, have you experienced the Indian Railways use uh, on the railways themselves? Does that seem to be successful from what you've your own experience, and we'll, we'll be seeking audience participation at that point. Toilets in Indian Railways recently, improvement or no improvement? I think you can vote on the app. Perhaps, <laughs> you know, one very important thing when we talk about that this is civic sense. And I really think that as a country and as a people, we really don't have any civic sense. We don't take ownership of anything that we don't personally own. And so while some of the trains have become cleaner, there's a lot more that needs to be done because people don't use toilets properly. I mean, you know you need to go inside the toilet and people will defecate all around it and make it a complete mess. So the one part that the railways has done is started putting in these biodigesters. But then the only challenge that they have faced is you need to correctly anticipate the number of users. Mm -hmm. That is what determines the size of the digester. How successful is it? Is it still smelling or not? I haven't used any of the trains post yeah. the digesters being installed, so we'll have to ask the audience about that. But, um, you know, we, we're never going to have a clean country unless all of us also participate. Infrastructure and capacity building and community participation are all equally important. The, uh, and Robin, uh, maybe I'm, yeah. I might ask you this time. I mean, what do you think might be a, a well-honed way in which India can deal with the question of cleaning those public spaces? Is it a question of technology? Is it a question of governance? It's also a question of caste. It is also a question of caste. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's the question that uh, was partly addressed this morning. Uh, if you were at the earlier session, the uh, secretary of the relevant ministry said that he believed that the whole Swatch Bharat program and the kind of political uh, or the uh, political advertising and the social advertising that's gone with it is contributing to the undermining of caste. Now, I think if we had uh, Beswara Wilson from the Safai Karmachari Andolan here, he would dispute that. Uh, but Asi, what's been your experience in Varanasi with the nexus between caste and the cleanliness, particularly in matters of human waste? Well, I guess uh, we start our book with a guy called yeah. Malu. And, and uh, I've been living and working in Varanasi for uh, uh, several uh, decades now, coming and going to the city. And uh, while my earlier book was about the Ganga and the river, uh, when we started uh, writing this book on waste, I was talking to people that I've known for years, and, I, and, and one of whom is called Malu, and I asked him, what is your name? What, what, where does the name come from? And he says, Malu, so that, that means feces. And I asked, well, why would your mother call you that name? 
And he said, well, go and ask my mother, which I did. And she explained that uh, she called him that way because her three previous children have died before the age of five. She didn't know from what, but I expect it was diarrhea or dehydration. And the, the elderly people told her that she should name her son, her, her newborn, his feces and put him in the sewage so that he is protected because the gods wouldn't covet him, wouldn't want him anymore. So in a, in, in a kind of paradoxical way, named feces protects you. It's almost a, a prophylactic. Right? Uh, Malu, fortunately, today has uh, three kids of his own. But there are uh, several cases like that where people in, on the ground, low castes, people who are disenfranchised, have to deal and experience waste in ways that we don't necessarily imagine if we live in gated community or housing societies. And the same holds, I think, in other places that we visited, whether in the slums of Mumbai or Delhi or even Trivandrum, where we saw people that are constantly grappling with this everyday human waste. It's not enough. You, you can't put septic tanks for people who are living in condensed areas. It just doesn't work. So that where do they, these people go and relieve themselves? Now the problem that emerges is that if you tag these people as stigmatized who are, who are practicing open defecation but they don't have where to go, then they, they, it, it's one step before being criminalized. We know of instances where these people have been photographed, been, there was violence enacted upon them because they go to defecate in the open. And I'm not even talking about women. I mean, women have a whole slew of, of issues that they have to deal with, with urinary tract infections when they don't go to the loo. I mean, you might be more... Yes, I mean, women and girls are the most vulnerable. I mean, I'm not saying men don't need toilets. We all do. But when you talk about girls staying in school, very often by the time they hit 13 or 14 and hit puberty and they get their periods, they stop going to school because they don't have access to adequate sanitation. And not only, I believe we can't talk about sanitation without talking about water because at the end of the day, if we want to improve the health metrics of the country, both of them are intrinsically linked. Yes. And you want to come in? Yeah, I think the, the water question is absolutely crucial, as uh, you've alluded. There were those uh, devastating figures that came out in 2015, which showed stunting amongst Indian children was higher than that among Bangladeshi children. And I think that uh, gave an added impetus to the Swatch Bharat campaign, because these were international figures. Stunting means that babies are simply not growing at the rate they should. And the explanation for this is very often intestinal parasites. So that when a baby is growing, it's got parasites in its tummy that are eating the nutrients that should be building bone and sinew and making a strong baby. The surveys were showing, I think, 39% of uh, Indian babies were stunted. Only 36% of Bangladeshi babies were. The Bangladeshis, of course, loved that. It was in the star of Dhaka regularly that they had scored in a, a social indicator over, over India. Uh, but th th those, uh, that stunting seems to be, if we go back, there's been a book released in the last year in India um, by two, again, foreign scholars called uh, Where India Goes, which makes this case, uh, tries to make the case very strongly, the connection between bad water and uh, stunted babies. And of course, infant mortality goes with stunting. If a baby is going to be stunted, it may also die under the age of 12 months or a child under the age of five years. So uh, it, this is just to reinforce uh, Sanjayta's point about the crucialness of water. But Sanjayda, what, is the, what are the prospects for improving the distribution of good water, particularly in areas you've worked in and even more difficult uh, areas? Well, you know, um, it is difficult, but I believe that with every challenge there is an opportunity. So when you talked about caste, going back to that, water, I believe, is the carrot that we use when we want to deal with sanitation. So we work in the Dalit community areas, and we say that we'll set up the entire drinking water and sanitation system in the Dalit community area, which we face a lot of resistance initially from the upper caste saying that they don't want to come into the Dalit area to collect water. But then this is one of the steps where you can have gradual reform. That is how your barriers, caste barriers get broken down. And when you talk about water, 
uh, I believe that, you know, we need to optimize the water that we have available, and that is, uh, you know, like in the toilets that we use, the secretary just talked about using toilets which use much less water. So we use, on an average, a liter and a half per flush versus what we get access to in the larger cities. Mm. So, I mean, water certainly is a very important issue, but the other way of addressing water is looking at untreated sewage. Look at what Singapore's done. Yeah. That's what ma we did in Delhi in 2015, where we treated raw, untreated sewage mm. and converted that into WHO standard safe drinking water. Because I really believe that unless we look at recycled water as an important element, we're never really going to be water secure. But I mean, unfortunately, uh, the project was successful, but it, in a sense, hit a dead wall because there's a huge resistance about drinking water mm -hmm. whose source is literally sewage or shit. And, and um, that is something that we Please. hope will change in the months and years to come. Yes, and I think as you rightly said this morning, what you can do in Singapore, it may have been Madula Ramesh, but what, uh, what you can do in Singapore, you can't necessarily do in India. Mrs. Gandhi once told Lee Kuan Yew that unlike him, she was running a country and not a shopping center. So it, uh, Singapore is different in that way. But new water, it's called new water, is available in bottles, and that's pure sewage and literally purified sewage. And a great deal of the rest of the recycled water goes into industrial purposes, as you say. I think another very important thing that we, today I was reading the paper uh, in the morning and I saw that Jaipur itself is dealing with the question of demonstrating that it is engaging with Swatch Bharat and it's failing to do so. I mean, when you think about sanitation, when you think about public spaces, how do you maintain people's investment in this project of Swatch Bharat? I mean, clearly, Modi's project of Vikas and progress is important. The, the biggest diaspora in the world, the Indian diaspora, wants to see an India that looks like other countries. But on the ground, what do you think the, 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 the way in which you can engage the population to understand that these public spaces are their own public spaces and they should be invested in it? I'm just, in fact, coming from Varanasi, from the Pravasi Devas, where I was speaking, and I agree with you when you say that we have the largest diaspora, and they, when they come back, hopefully they want to give back to their country and to their roots. And uh, this, is, this is a challenge that we face with the advent of urbanization, with, uh, you know, with, with more people moving into our cities. How do we keep them clean? This can't happen unless you have uh, public engagement, and they be part of the project. So I believe that infrastructure is one part of the solution. You can't tell a person don't litter without having proper dustbins or waste management systems. And many of our municipalities are really grappling with the kind of waste that we're creating. But some of them, on the other hand, like Vishakhapatnam, has done a very good job. So at the end of the day, it's about people coming together and coming forward. That's the only way this is ever going to work. But I want to yeah. ask you, as people who've come in from outside, how do you look at this? Uh, problem. I mean, do you see hope? Do you, when you come in from outside, are you just confronted by waste, or how do you look at it? Uh, I've spent uh, quite a bit of my career w worrying about Kerala and trying to understand Kerala. And Kerala, of course, has the highest literacy rate in the country and has done for over since the time of independence. That primary education that's been imparted in Kerala over the years, plus the NGO movement and the active political parties, uh, Kerala is all, was open defecation free really before the campaign started. And of course, Kerala has the lowest infant mortality of the major states. Uh, it has uh, uh, the lowest measure of childhood stunting. And uh, open defecation has been very rare in the 40 years I've been going back and forth to Kerala, uh, now I think overwhelmingly uh, open defecation free. So I'm thinking that primary education, as it improves, and it's, uh, again, we've heard it said there, this morning, there are targeted districts across the country that are not described as backward, they're described as aspirational. There's nothing like being aspirational. Uh, it, it's a, it's a great word for making everyone feel better. The important thing is there are policies trying to target particular districts. But one of the most important elements of the target is primary education. If you can educate particularly girls to year eight, you build fine homemakers, you know, you build people 
who are able to understand the importance of clean water, of boiling water, of purifying water, and more important in the Kerala case, as we know, Malayalis have a reputation for being very stroppy and demanding people, and it's a, a reputation to be proud of. You demand clean water. You say to your MLAs and your local municipal councillors, we want clean water, and if we don't get it, we'll make your lives as uncomfortable as we poor, uh, corpor uh, poor uh, citizens can. So I think primary education holds out a lot of hope for these districts. Absolutely. I think that another thing to remember is that India is such a, you asked what, what draws us to India. India is a diverse place. It's a fascinating place on so many counts. But also when you talk about waste, in different parts of India, waste doesn't behave the same. No. If you think about human waste that's exposed in tropical areas like Kerala, it's very different than human waste and what happens to human waste in Rajasthan, which is starved of water, or in UP, where the population is very condensed with two, over 200 million people. So it's important that these things, that technology as a wholesale will not operate the same across India. It's, it's important to cater it to the particular places. Yes. yes, you can't have one solution for the entire country. Mm -hmm. That'll just never work. You need to have your grassroots people working in the panchayats, in the districts, to have the freedom to decide what works best for them. So Vishakapatnam, where I work, which is where the water level, water tables are very high, the twin pit system is perhaps not the best solution because very often the waste get the groundwater level gets contaminated and it just doesn't work. During the monsoons, you have flooding. So perhaps what will work in Rajasthan versus Kashmir versus Andhra is not a one simple solution that you can just directly replicate. You will have to look at local factors before you do that on the ground. Yeah, Sanjata, I'd like to pull our conversation back to what you're saying about local solutions and the, no the role that local government is expected to play in creating a clean India. It's my view, we have a chapter on local government in our book called Local Government and Limitations. And local governments in India have the uh, splendid uh, attribute of having been recognized in the constitution. So it is constitutionally illegal not to have duly constituted local governments in every area of India, rural and urban. That's not the case, I think, in most of the other English-speaking uh, democracy, certainly not in Australia. Local government is a creature of the state government. That's a very nice thing, the constitutional provision. Unfortunately, it hasn't been thoroughly acted on, and local governments remain the clients of state governments. State governments are all too likely to want to adopt one-size-fits-all solutions for problems. Local governments are underpowered for the kind of work that is expected of them in making the country clean. It's their job to keep their neighborhoods and their cities clean. It's, it's not that they don't have the potential to raise funds, but they often lack the authority to do it, and they lack the authority to act on their own, to be responsible for their own decisions. The CEOs of the major cities are members of the Indian Administrative Service. Elsewhere in the world, local governments have the authority to advertise for a chief executive officer, to accept uh, applications, and to decide on someone and offer them a five-year contract. People make careers in local government. It's a highly specialized area of public administration and policy. Uh, too often in India, it's treated as a place where state civil servants may be deposited if they're sometimes not very good at their job. It's not, I think, a cherished role for an Indian administrative service officer. It might be a, a role they play on their way up the ladder. Uh, but the notion that local government is both a powerful, well-rewarded and respected area of uh, life that one could uh, dedicate one's life to in some ways, I think that's absent. And that makes it very difficult for the fine officers you do find in local government. And there's some absolutely wonderful people uh, one meets going around the country talking to people engaged in waste management, 
terrifically dedicated people with great ideas and good science behind them. There aren't enough of them, and they're not rewarded or recognized sufficiently, it seems to me. What would you say, though, Sanjay? Here I'll have a different point of view. Let me yes. share my experience with you, and it's been now seven years. I'd say a reasonable mm -hmm. amount of time for me to have experienced various kind of people to have worked with. Now, we work with the local government, and when I talk about the government, I talk about the Sarpanch, the mm -hmm. Panchayat, mm -hmm. and they do have a lot of power, and mm -hmm. we make them part of the entire process from day one, which is to begin with, identify where we should actually implement the solution. And initially, I remember it used to take us time to get them on board, but once you have a few success stories, then they are as interested in ensuring that there are good projects in their villages and in their communities. So, I mean, I guess, may, or maybe south of the Vindhyas, there's a little more political commitment to development issues because I work in Vishakhapatnam and I can tell you, I've worked in over 30 villages now. We've, uh, and we largely work with women sarpanches. Uh, and uh, the experience that we've had with them is, is encouraging. Yes, there have been challenges, but when you talk about working with government, I think we need to go at the bottom of the pyramid and say we have to work bottom up. Yes. Not working with ministers and secretaries, I mean, they create policy, but at the end of the day, they don't execute anything on the ground. Ward, ward corporators in the cities and sarpanches in the rural panchayats. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is a, a critical point because what you're saying to me illuminates the point that you have to partner with local government and the people on the ground, not, not as receivers of benefits, but there's people who would do something meaningful yes. to deal with waste, not only sewage, but also material waste. When we were working in Pune, we, we met some remarkably committed NGOs which are working with waste pickers who are landless laborers from that area and who come to the city as part of the internal immigration process. And the first port of call for them is to collect waste. Now, these people work in the informal market, India's informal market, overwhelmingly is resourced with these laborers, informal laborers, this army, reserve army of labor that deals with waste. How do you incorporate these people in a meaningful way to engage waste so that it becomes productive, that it gains value, that it rewards them with dignity, that they have protection gear? And one of the examples that we saw was this, this uh, NGO, which did it very successfully. But then a new municipal commissioner comes in and for him, it's all about the bottom line. And he wanted to get contractors. And so he got contractors who mobilized the waste in Pune according to weight. And that's, that was the, the, the bottom line mm -hmm. for him. And then he said to the people, you don't get any more holiday pay. I'm not going to give you gloves or boots or anything. All I care is that you collect as much waste and we get it to the landfill so that it makes money. So unless you get these contracted to be as committed and as partnered, these things won't be successful. The, uh, that, uh, the last point we'll make here before we ask for your participation, uh, 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 let me ask you, uh, Sanchaita, uh, the, uh, the civil society movements, NGOs, one of the great strengths of India, it seems to me, are that there are still, there's still plenty of space for active NGOs. Not the case in most countries in the world today. Um, but do you, as an NGO yourself, do you talk to other NGOs enough? Do you get together to discuss these problems? No, I think there's room for much more uh, collective effort that we can all put in together because I think that you know when everybody works in the same direction you get that much more strength and power to actually be the change you want to see but I really believe that you know I mean this problem is not going to be solved by government alone and this problem is something that is in our daily lives it affects every one of us mm. with the air that you breathe with the water that we have with the food that we get which is not safe anymore it's contaminated Waste is entering our life from every imaginable angle. And it is up to us to create that pressure for our political establishment to also take note of this and treat this as a priority. So, I mean, yes, civil society has its role to play. As nonprofits, we have a role to play in engaging with them and mobilizing them as a force to reckon with. And um, there is a lot more that we can do. Well, we're going to go for questions and comments now. We're going to start from the back. We've been given a protocol. Oh, there's a lovely question at the back. Right, that's it. We'll start there and we'll work our way to the front. 
Yes, please. Not too long, though, please, sir. Uh, hi there. Um, so I, I've been running a, a software company in Bangalore for about the past six years. Uh, it's relatively small. It's about seven crore. Um, but almost everyone else I know in Bangalore runs a similar size company. None of these companies have anything to do with waste management or uh, <clears throat> generally anything to do with NGOs. Everyone has this concern. Um, and on an individual level, it's very difficult to do anything. Uh, Corporate-wise, we all compost, we all segregate our waste, we all try to educate all our staff, um, and it feels like a drop in the bucket. Um, for corporations like ours, what would you suggest uh, is the best course of action? Where can we put our money? Where can we act? Sanjay, well, it's little drops of water that make the ocean. So everything that everybody does counts and is very important. Um, I, I'm not going to hold a candle for everybody in the nonprofit world because it is a murky world in the nonprofit space as well. And uh, all I would say is that, you know, start from within your community. That's the best place to start. So whether it's at work, whether it's in school, whether it's your neighborhood, deal with waste, you know, compost, segregate waste, empower people around you. And that's perhaps the best way to start. I, mean. I think that at the other end of, of the spectrum, we can also think about India's poor people who are constantly consuming these fast consumer goods in small packets, whether it's pan masala, shampoos, or laundry powder, which again, the corporates can start withdrawing from those little packets that clog the sewage and, and, and bring in vermin and mosquitoes and so on, so that there's more pressure on the corporations themselves to limit the kind of packaging and to take responsibility for what they are doing in promoting a consumer society. Oh, let the gentleman, yeah, the gentleman in the red turban, and then, sir, you, then let him go next, then. We'll, we'll follow our, the, in the white, the gentleman in the white. Okay, thank um, you. Would it be, how would one create more civic awareness and civic pride to clean India? Would it not be possible for a chief minister to say, we are going to have national cleanup day, and every corporation in Jaipur, every policeman, every civil servant has got to go out for three hours and pick up rubbish and have the chief minister leading it to really bring about this message. Because it strikes me in India, unless it starts from the top, but of course it has to be adopted by a politician who shares your vision. But unless something like that happens, all of these small NGOs we just heard will do their great work, but the big message will never come through. So yeah. I think you've got to preach to the most senior politician, make it an election winner. We've cleaned up Jaipur, something like that. Well, <laughs> the, uh, well we, both want to, we both want to say something <laughs> about this. Um, uh, one of the, we were having a conversation before we came, and of course Narendra Modi, uh, one does, uh, uh, Sanjay has uh, just joined the BJP. I would not be a BJP voter if I lived in India, so we come from two different political perspectives, perhaps. But Narendra Modi is the first prime minister that we were able to locate who was ever photographed with a broom making a political statement by sweeping. Now, sure, these are uh, photographs taken for political purposes, but he has done more, I think, than any other prime minister to push and push on this notion of clean India. And the kind of, uh, the kind of statewide uh, activity that you've suggested, I suspect if we looked over the last five years, we'd find some states had done exactly that. But I couldn't put my finger on one, but Sancheta. Yes, I agree with you. You know, the power, we forget sometimes that symbolism is also very powerful. And that picture of a prime minister holding a broom, talking about waste management in a country which is deeply caste ridden is a very, very powerful image. And when you talk about you know, having senior officers go in or chief ministers go in, some of them have done that. In fact, we have a very dynamic water and sanitation secretary. His name is Parmeshwaran Ayer. From Ayer, you know what his caste is. And he goes into the sanitation pits and cleans it himself, leading by example. So there is a lot that has been done. There's a lot more that needs to be done. But sanitation in India is such a complex subject. Waste management has not been priority. 
at least now we're talking about it. I'll give you one little example. I started my work in 2011. And up till 2014, whenever I'd reach out to a corporate saying, come and support my work, give me some, you know, uh, fund my projects, they would say, oh, we would love to fund your water part of it or the renewable energy part of it. But sanitation, are you crazy? It's a terrible brand association. We're not going to give you any money. Post 2014, at least there's more money coming into the sector. It's a long road ahead, but at least we're on that path. Um, and the gentleman, the very patient and kindly gentleman here in the, in the red turban. Uh, please use the microphone, sir. And not, not too long, but uh, something to the point. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, we have got Jaipur I mean, I address to all three of you. We, I'm from the International Emergency Management Society. It is a non-profit, and we got Jaipur selected as one of the 100 resilient cities pioneered by Rocky Pillar Foundation. And uh, I've been working for the last five years proactively and pro bono, but the, there have been four mayors, there have been seven commissioners, <sighs> and the, it, the project is not moving unless yes. they sign, it is pending for an MOU, unless they sign a chief vigilant officer who will, uh, whose salary will be paid by Rockefeller Foundation cannot be appointed. So mm -hmm. can you, you people guide me, or some people of you who can join to make the Jaipur city uh, resilient against shock and stress. Stress is daily living, including garbage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I'd like to put a question to the audience, too. Uh, has anyone traveled on Indian railways where the new toilets are in use? Uh, the, not a single only Not a single person. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Many Indias in India. Yes, yes. Um, then, further questions. The lady back here, uh, yes. Can you see on the right-hand side with the nice uh, scarf? Yes, that's the lady. Yes, yes, please. I have traveled. I have traveled. Uh, could you uh, put the mic? I have traveled. Yeah. Uh, uh, you were asking who has traveled. I have traveled. Yeah. yeah. And the new what, toilet. Yes, what I was have. your experience? Uh, it seemed same as the earlier one. It was cleaner. Uh -huh. But the one who is using it, uh, there is no difference. Uh, Aha, aha. Okay. The, well, the bio toilet, right? You're asking about the bio toilet. Any improvement? Yeah, it was cleaner. The cleaner, so, yeah. The suprastructure of the latrine is cleaner. Yes. Okay. And of, of course, the advantage is that human excrement isn't dropping onto the rails exactly. or indeed uh -huh. human so nitrogen. The, the one who is using the toilet, it's not for them, I guess. It's about the environment, the people around. Indeed, them. yes. Yeah. But if you're asking about my experience of using it, it was the same. Thank you. That's great. The, uh, and uh, let's see, what have, anybody else at the back? Uh, the gentleman here with the scarf, then. Um. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, I run a company into solid waste management for past 10 years. And first of all, I would like to congratulate both of you because it's an extensive work you have done and a book on waste is itself, it's a very, very enlightening book. I have read it uh, twice because I'm a waste management professional. Uh, a key feature from both of you uh, during your course of research in India, what is the immediate uh, uh, a problem you find which needs to improve in terms of implementation of waste management projects in India, and especially working with the corporations and, uh, and the gram panchayats? I think that what we mentioned before the, the issue of waste has to be a multi-pronged solution. It can't be confined to technology. It can't be confined to political pressures or economic practices. It has to incorporate in a meaningful way all these sectors alongside the waste pickers. Because the waste chain is quite a complex chain where the waste increases value for those who recycle it, but the people at the bottom of the chain remain stranded. And if we want those people to continue, if you've already got those people that are dealing with waste, why not give them the dignity and rewards that they should receive as a result of working with this? The, uh, and there's a, there was a lady, yeah, where? In the yellow. In the yellow. Thank you. <laughs> um, you mentioned how our prime minister uh, holding a broomstick in his hand serves as a, like a symbol uh, and it serves the purpose of spreading the message that everybody should come out and clean. You also talked about uh, Mr. Iyer, who being a Brahmin, 
Uh, you said that he enters the pits or? Twin pits. Yeah, okay. Like um, but I've Twin also pits. heard our prime minister give a statement like the sewage cleaners who enter the pits, they derive a sort of uh, spiritual experience out of it. I quite not agree with that. Uh, but I would also like to say that you mentioning that a Brahmin entering a pit um, is a great example. Why can't we focus on a situation where nobody has to enter the pit? Because it's one of the most humiliating things uh, yes. for a human being to do, be it a Brahmin or a anybody. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you, and that's why we only implement bio toilets where there's no human intervention that's required. But at the end of the day, there's also a cost factor, and that is something that I hope, and that's what we've been pitching to the government, saying that poor people don't need poor solutions. The twin pit uh, approach is one approach, but bio toilets is a very, very human approach because there's no human intervention that's required. And just to give you a little bit of clarity on what you said, when Mr. Iyer enters the pits, uh, the pits that you are talking about are actually the septic tanks which it is banned for human beings to enter septic tank tanks in the sewage pipelines, and that is something that is completely unacceptable. What the sanitation secretary is talking about are the twin pit systems where the, the human waste goes into one tank, it is kept sealed for a year, then it goes into the second tank, and the first tank, whatever's gone in, is manure. So it's no longer unsafe for a human being to come in contact with it. But I agree that when there is a technology that is available, why do we even need to do that? I'm fully in agreement with what you say, and I do hope that not only government, even the corporate sector, even private, the private sector, who's very much part of the sanitation movement, they also rise to the occasion, because very often we turn to government for everything. There is no magic wand that they can come out with. They can't solve all the problems. Industry also has a role to play, and unfortunately, I find it very disappointing, but I really don't think industry has risen to the occasion and set their own golden standards, and uh, that's... i just add to that, that I think it's a very important point that you raised. We don't say, I don't think that we should promote the ideal bhangi uh, 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 type that re gains so some kind of spiritual knowledge from the practice of diving into these pits in any way. I think that uh, Ambedkar's view is far more pertinent to what's going on in India now and the annihilation of the system. But there is also the reality, and I've, I've in, in the course of the work that I've done, I've worked with people who dive into these pits without any protection, and they, uh, there, there's people that are uh, dying from the methane that uh, is in the sewage. Five every week is the latest statistics. These things should be removed. But at the same time, technology alone won't save the situation. You have to incorporate these people who have the local knowledge of what to do and how to do it in the most effective way. And in that way, you can solve it. Um, and the gentleman down here, uh, yes, who's been very patient. Thank you. Myself is Umesh Prashad Singh from the University of Calcutta. I'm a creative writer. After listening to both of you with rapt attention, what I, what I felt that it is collective effort and the collective responsibility combined together. If we have these two with scientific temper, this solution, what we are discussing about cleanliness and all that, can be solved. This is what I feel in the sense of. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one, what will probably be one final question. Uh, the gentleman here who is very quick. We haven't done gender balance very well. But... A very good evening to you, sir. I am Rajiv. I am an ex investor and banker. I want to know if I am making an NGO to clean a city which is spread across 100 square kilometers. How many men would I need and how many days to clean up a city like this? Sorry, I, just, I didn't catch NGO, the question. An NGO if I am making, how many days I need to clean up a city like this which is spread across 100 square kilometers and how many men would I need? It depends on which city. <laughs> 100 square kilometers with a population of around 30 lakhs. No, no, what I said is, is it less depends on which city. I mean, it's very I'm not dealing with any industry, which is less industrialized, only the bio waste we are talking about. Only the fecal matter which should be properly managed. Uh, 
It's uh, very difficult to put a number like that. All I can say is that, you know, uh, Vishakapattam is a city, Indore is a city. You have so many cities. Each city has its own challenges. I've just come back from, uh, you know, I mean, you look at Jaipur. I don't know. I don't know very much about the waste management sy system here, but in Delhi, Everybody is grappling with that, and I don't think a nonprofit can aspire to solve that. You can play a role in it, but at the end of the day, it has to be a collective effort of the municipality and nonprofits and citizens and industry. I, I don't think we should be under any illusion that we can go and solve it, though it's nice to be optimistic. I think on that note, we'll, we'll close. May I thank you for being such a kind and generous audience. And do take your waste with you and put it in the appropriate receptacle. Just before we close, I'd like to pay a kind of tribute to the people who have kept the toilets here so amazingly yes. clean over five days. Yes. Uh, I'm a, I've visited most of them, I think, in the time I've been here, and they've been uh, remarkable. So there's a tribute for Swatch Bharat. So thank you very much for coming. You have been listening to Asa Dharma.